One of the gifts the Lord has brought to friends is a lovely, intelligent lady with a marvelous gift to teach, Sherry Hervold. She is the featured speaker on this CD. Her message is entitled, Naomi's Journey to Destiny. Here now is Sherry. Good evening, ladies. I want to speak to you for a few minutes about a widow, a widow with a destiny, a God-ordained destiny. Now, in the book of Ruth, in the Old Testament, we read a story which sets the background for our lesson. Let me read a portion of that scripture to you. It's found in the book of Ruth, the first chapter, and the first five verses. In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a man from Bethlehem in Judah left the country because of a severe famine. He took his wife and two sons and went to live in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Malon and Kilian. During their stay in Moab, Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, and the other a woman named Ruth. But about 10 years later, both Malon and Kilian died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. Now the death of these three men leaves behind a pretty tragic scene. We have Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, widows. Widows with no heirs, no property, and no inheritance. And any way you look at it, at this particular time in history, that spelled poverty and dire circumstances especially so for Naomi, for not only is she old and past childbearing years, but Moab is strange and inhospitable to her. She had only the graves of her husband and her sons, and believe you me, they were small comfort. This, without a doubt, is the lowest point of Naomi's life, her grief is so deep that she's almost paralyzed by it. Grief has a way of doing that to the heart of a person. Oh, it is hard for her to face each long, lonely day, but perhaps even harder to face the nights. Someone, most likely someone who's experienced the bone-chilling pain of loss through death, has said that grief is deeper when the sun goes down and memories rise up with the moon and the stars. And that would seem to be the case for Naomi. And so it is with the taste of salt from freshly fallen tears that Naomi begins to reflect on her life. And as she does so, a plan begins to foment in her mind. You see, Naomi knows that if one doesn't purpose to take steps otherwise, grief will morph into self-pity, and self-pity is sure death to the soul of an individual. And she begins to weigh her options. She has heard that the situation in Israel has changed and that the Lord is blessing the land again with a good harvest of grain. Thoughts of the possibility of living out her days free from the worries of where her next meal was coming from, surrounded by family members and memories of those precious young years of her marriage to Elimelech and the early years of her son's lives percolated through her mind during those sleepless nights. And it is thus that she decides to take that first step toward her journey back to her homeland, to her friends, her family, her roots, back to wholeness again and she states her intentions to return 
to Bethlehem. Oh, don't think that she did so without some fear and trepidation in her heart. The fact that she had traveled the road didn't any way allay her fears. Perhaps that served only to heighten her fears. She was familiar with the dangers and the difficult terrain that she would face. Her first crossing was made as a younger wife with the protection of a husband and two strong sons. Now she was an old woman with no male companions to help assure a safe trip. Doubtless, doubtless there are those to whom I am speaking who are at this very juncture in your life journey after the deep wounds of widowhood. At first, your memories were a comfort, but now they only serve to heighten your awareness of what it is you've lost. Planning for holidays, traveling to visit the children, all the tasks surrounding the care of the house and yard, going to birthday parties for the grandchildren, eating out, even the mundane tasks like shopping for groceries. Oh, they are all tasks that you too are familiar with. You know how to undertake them, how to execute them, but now you must face doing them alone. And it is almost too much to bear. And you too face a decision. Will you just withdraw from life? Or will you take that first very difficult step back to wholeness? Now, when our story takes place, once you were married, your husband's family became yours. So it was according to custom that the daughters-in-law would accompany Naomi. The three women pack and prepare for the journey and start on their way to Judah. At some point on the journey before they've gone too far, Naomi realizes the gravity of the situation for her two daughters-in-law, and she suddenly stops. She looks at them, and then she tells them, go back. Go back to your own blood families. You've been good to me, and I pray that God will be good to you and that you will find rest in the home of another husband. Oh, I can just imagine the tears that begin to flow at this point. Tears enough to end a drought have already fallen from their eyes because of the deaths of their beloved men, and their hearts are aching for what was. And this entreaty starts the flow again. Another separation another wrenching tearing of the heartstrings. In response, Ruth and Orpah soundly protest, all the while weeping loudly. How could they possibly think of leaving their husband's mother? The scriptures give us a little insight at this point to Naomi's thoughts. I'm too old to bear more sons for these girls to marry. <laughs> And they wouldn't wait that long, even if I were able to do so. She might have even considered that her Moabite daughters-in-law wouldn't be too warmly received by her Hebrew family in Bethlehem. Now, the next scene in our story is familiar to all of us. Orpah's resistance to her mother-in-law caves in, and she acquiesces to Naomi's cajoling. But Ruth's resolve to go with her mother-in-law is as firm as ever. And it's at this point that Ruth utters those words which are often quoted or sung at sentimental occasions. Don't urge me to leave you or to return back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. 
Oh, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. So Orpah turned back to the gods of her people, and Ruth moved toward the God of Abraham. And it is here that we pick up our story of Naomi and Ruth's journey back to Bethlehem. I've called this Naomi's journey to her destiny, because in reality, that's what it was for her and for Ruth as well. But they don't know that. Can we ever know what God has awaiting us just around the corner of our life's journey? Their hearts are still heavy, and Naomi is burdened with the foreboding thoughts of what awaits her in Bethlehem. She's destitute and will be dependent upon her brethren for sustenance. And while she loves Ruth, as I mentioned, she's probably harboring some apprehensions as to how she'll be received since she's a Moabite. And then there's the journey itself. It always boils down to the journey itself, doesn't it? Remember, these are two women traveling alone on an open road, a dangerous road that takes them over some very rough and isolated terrain. In addition to the mountains they will have to traverse, the long stretches of valleys and the stepland roads, they have to traverse two major waterways, the Arnon and Jordan Rivers. And there wasn't just the geographical difficulties to consider. You see, Moab and Judah, political enemies, shared a border which made traveling along this territory high risk and dangerous for anyone. And these two women had no guards, no one to give them protection. That is no one but God. And this is where their faith in God was tested once again. I can imagine that each morning Naomi would call on God for his protection and do the same each night. For 120 perilous miles, these two women had no one but God to protect them on this exhausting and dangerous trek. But protect them he did, and brought them safely to the land of Naomi's people. I can just imagine that there are those of you who can identify with Naomi. You too have lost the love of your life. You too have cried until you feel there are no tears left. And then you, like Naomi, Consider your situation and realize that you have no one on whom you can really depend to protect and lead you on your journey into the next phase of your life, but God himself. Oh, you too may have children to offer you some company and emotional and moral support. You appreciate this and cherish their love and kindness but it's not enough. Some mornings you've been so overwhelmed by your loss and your fears of facing life alone that you just want to pull the covers over your head and call it quits. But you, like Naomi, have called on God for his guidance and protection, and you put your feet on the floor, and moment by moment, day by day, week after week, month after month, and for some of you, year after year, you have experienced God's provision and protection surrounding you. Ah, uh, but there are some of you who still need to take that step of faith, a step you've avoided taking because of your fears. What will happen to me if I do that? It's too painful to do alone. Perhaps your excuse is that you're too old and without the aid and protection of a husband, you just can't make that journey back. 
Now is the time that God wants to be your husband, your protector, your, dare I say it, your knight in shining armor. You know, Naomi's fears were no less than yours. But she put God to the test and God's provision for food and water and physical protection was a sure thing throughout that long journey. Now the scriptures tell us that when Naomi left Bethlehem with her family of four, that she went out full. You know, when our children and our spouses are around our tables and we're sharing the joys of an intact family, we feel complete, so content. But now, as we see Naomi hobbling into town, after that very arduous trip from Moab, the scriptures tell us she came home again empty. It was a broken-hearted, bitter Naomi who made her appearance now in Bethlehem without the three men with whom she had departed over a decade previously. And she announces her bitterness to anyone willing to listen. Call me Mara, meaning bitter, for I'm no longer a pleasant woman. I am sorely wounded at heart. The Almighty has greatly afflicted me. She called out to them. What a sad, sad scene. Think about it. After surviving the death of the three men who meant the most in the world to her, after surviving a journey without being killed by enemies or raped by cruel soldiers or raiders along the trail, without being eaten by wild animals or starving to death. She walks into town carrying a heart full of despair and emptiness and hopelessness. Doubtless tongues wagged. Naomi had changed so much that she was hardly recognizable even to her family and friends, aged and stooped as she was by her grief and poverty. You know, Naomi's story could have ended here. She'd reached Bethlehem. That was her destination. But her destiny was not fulfilled. Oh, many of you like Naomi have traveled from a mountaintop existence of contentment into a deep and dark valley of sorrow. Some of you may feel that you've done all that you know to do. You've taken those giant steps in turning your life around. And yet, and yet you feel joyless, perhaps even hopeless, that life will again have meaning and purpose for you. Oh, don't ever give up on the goodness of God and never underestimate the degree of compassion that he feels for you. Listen to the rest of Naomi's story. You see, it was shortly after this that God brought into her life and the life of her beloved daughter-in-law a highly respected man and a kinsman of Naomi's called Boaz. And Naomi, with a firm trust in God, using the wisdom of age and the knowledge of the culture, graciously guided Ruth into winning the heart and hand of Boaz in marriage. And when their child, Obed, was born, the scriptures tell us that Naomi praised God, who didn't leave her childless and without a family to love her and someone to carry on the family name. Joy literally flooded her heart, and tears of gratefulness now filled her eyes. What a wonderful ending to a great story. Except that the story isn't over. The boy Obed, the same one whom Naomi loved and cared for as her own, he became the father of Jesse, who was the father of David, king of Israel, 
and a part of the lineage of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, God honored that forgotten widow in exceptional ways, for he had never truly forgotten her. The great theologian Abraham Kuyper put it this way, what is chiefly important is that he, God, caused her blood to mingle with that which the Son of God took into his human heart and which was poured at Golgotha for the salvation of the world. Thus, Naomi's destiny was fulfilled. Ladies, you too have a destiny. Jeremiah 29, 11 reminds you, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. But here's where you come into play because the next verse says, you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Ladies, I encourage you to make the pursuit of God your chief aim. And who knows, but that you, like Naomi, may have those within your own family or neighborhood even that need you to reach out to them. And as you become involved in the lives of others, you too will find a new purpose for your life. Keep taking those steps of faith daily, putting your trust and confidence in the Lord. Keep seeking for and calling upon Him. He has promised, He has promised that He will listen and that you will find Him. Oh, you may have completed one leg of your journey, but you may even have arrived in your Bethlehem, but never mistake that as having fulfilled your destiny because it is God's desire that you live a life overflowing with joy, peace, and purpose. That's your rightful heritage as a child of God. So let me wish you good tour as you continue on your journey to your destiny, a God-ordained destiny.